Why are there fires? Because it's too dry. There's drought. Why is it too dry? Well, I postulate it's because humans have cut down the climax forests, which moderate the climate. Including in that moderation is the collection of rainwater when it does rain and the rehydration of the atmosphere when it's dry. So we're in this predicament now. And maybe it's not a predicament, maybe it's a problem that we can solve. So the question is how can we rehydrate the landscape? I participated in a permaculture design course that was based on permaculture designer's manual and there are ideas within permaculture that I learned that would work. The largest obstacle that I can imagine being in the way of implementing this type of a design is how much it costs. And if everything was equal, okay, it does cost a lot of money, but let's compare it to how much is it costing to battle these fires and for all these homes to be destroyed. When we start comparing the costs of doing this type of work to the cost of all the damage and destruction. Doing the prevention, spending the money to prevent, to prevent the fires becomes a very low amount compared to what we're spending now to fight the fires. So I have a depiction here and I'll make it, this is gonna be on a very simple basis. I don't wanna drag this out into being a course. I just wanna hit the mainframe ideas and I mean you can go from there buy the book permaculture designers manual I mean there are other books that do this other than permaculture too that have this worked out so um, we have the and, and we're thinking west coast and we're thinking the scrublands we have a lot of elevation changes hills and whatnot all that brush and everything that's burning on them and all the houses so I just made two hills. Not every landscape looks like this, obviously. And every landscape are going to be differences and variables. This is only a mainframe idea. And what I'm talking about is otherwise known as swales. on contour. What this is is basically the simplest way to describe it is a ditch. You dig a ditch but the ditch is level. The bottom of the ditch is level. So you have to be on contour. If you're a fisherman and you look at lake contours those lines are indications where that is level ground. So this is the same thing. You see those contour lines on a map that's drawing the elevation changes, those lines are indicating level ground. So you're gonna build a ditch along that level ground and it may take you in serpentine patterns. You're not going up and down, but you're, you're gonna be going around in the landscape to see that it's level. Maybe there are obstacles in a way where you can't stretch that ditch out. Well then you end it and you start a new one down the line. You may be able to make a swale on contour that's 10 miles long there may be one that's 20 feet long. Lots of differences. But for the purposes of doing this mainframe, we're just going to do a couple small ones. Now here, on this hill, we can build a swale on contour all the way around the hill, right on the top. It goes all the way around the hill. It'll, it'll make you a circle. I built one of these on my land. I call it the circle swale. You can see this down here? You're not even see that. I don't know. Okay. Right. 
Probably can't see orange either, can you? I don't know. Oh, kind of. Well, I'll make it green. So that's going around the hilltop. What that swale does when it rains, the water is going to flow down the top of the hill. I got a blue one here. Flowing down the top of the hill and it's filling that swale. You also install what's called a spillway. It's a little bit of ground that's level, connected, or part of the swale. So when the water gets to that spillway level, you can direct the flow from your swale. So if we make our spillway right here, the spillway is going to be lower than the surrounding mound that's created from building the swale. You want to build the swale, and then the mound goes on the downhill side and that mound is what you're going to be leveling down to make that spillway. Now you have a collection point, You've created a collection point because this is where the water is flowing. You can have way more rainfall than normal where the 100 year rains are probably 10 year rains now and they're getting even more flooding. You can make an adjustable spillway here so that you can lower that spillway when the land is, is hydrated. And now that swale becomes a collection point to get the water off the landscape. So now we're collecting this water and we're going to build another swale. Maybe this one can't go all the way around because there's some boulders or granite or something in the way. And you're only going to have a swale that goes this far. Well now that water is going to collect into that swale that's coming down from the top. And it's going to spread out. and fill that swale. That's pretty slick. Now you think of a swale that may be 100 miles long, you have a rainstorm in 10 miles of it, and that water is going to be spread out along that entire 100 mile long swale. I don't think anybody would have considered this before all these fires, but now we're having all these fires. And there's going to be a legitimate question asked. How can we, we rehydrate the land so we don't have fires? I mean, is, this, is that too much of a question to ask or to answer? Okay, now there are a few other hi highlights that I can make here quickly. One is, you know, maybe here there's some level ground. There's a big flat right here. It's a large area that's relatively on contour, pretty close. And a lot of these deserts are pretty close to being on contour. So you got this level ground. You can direct one of these swales. The spillway, we have a spillway coming through here. And we can direct the water to spread out all across this landscape in all different directions. Where the whole thing becomes like a very shallow lake. And then the water soaks in here. This is, all these areas now become really good areas to plant trees that have deep roots that resist fire because they're, they can bring water up from very deep. I mean, some roots I've read can go you know, 100 feet deep, even deeper, draw water up. I think one of them is a mesquite. Not the scrub mesquite, but the tree mesquite. These are all things you can discover, just you got the internet, you type in these questions and answers pop up, right? Figure that out. Um, this is otherwise known as a Lamonia. And then there may be some really steep gullies that would otherwise wash the water. You can build what's called a gabion to slow down that rushing water going down the landscape. Now isn't it something I went from, why is it too dry? You know why we're having all these fires now all of a sudden I'm talking well how do we stop all that water from coming off the landscape and that's the point we 
want to slow down rainwater and we want to soak it in. In the course, my permaculture design teacher, whose name was Jeff Lawton, he's got an online course. I mean, I'm, I'm not really shilling for him, but that's just the course I took, participated in. <laughs> um, he said that these swales, once they're installed, it takes seven years. So we have rainy seasons for seven years in a row. And the soil will soak up enough water to withstand a hundred year drought. Okay. A very important piece to this isn't just that there are swales soaking in water. We also need to be planting trees. Trees are very important to stabilize the landscape. Uh, one argument against swales that I've read is, oh, the, the land is going to slump. Well, if you have the trees established, the roots in place, it's highly unlikely that the soil is going to slump. But let's say there's some hydro hydrological issue there where it's going to slump even if you have the right trees there. Well, you know, a little bit of the swale slumping, that's a very minor problem compared to all these fires. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the fires on the west coast of the United States. If you look at a satellite map right now, these are really minor fires compared to what's going on down in Brazil. Those fires in Brazil are just monsters. So this is what we need to do. Rehydrate the landscape. And then I had the idea of, you know, we're using helicopters to bring water up to these landscapes that are burning and spreading water all over the place. And of course, all these chemicals that they're wanting to spray to reduce the fires. Well, instead of that, why don't we use the helicopters to bring water and fill the swales up? And even a better idea than that, why don't we get these why don't we make these big huge windmills, you know, like they have over like in Denmark or wherever that was where they were pumping water at windmills. And we pump water, another pumping station, pump it up, pump it up, pump it up, and fill the swales with the water that's coming down the landscape. Or maybe there'll be springs popping up all over the place because we've soaked water in the landscape. Let's just pump that right back up to the top. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would work. Definitely over time it would be a lot less expensive than what we're doing now chasing the fire tail this is the fall crop of radishes that are growing I have one that's beginning to blossom, and that's always my cue to pull it out. So we're just going to pull this out and see what we got. Oh, we got a nice little radish. I expect the rest of these to get much larger than that. So these are the cow peas that I planted. They did really well. It's supposed to be dry the next three, four days, so at the end of the dry period, I'm going to clip them off at their roots and hang them in the shed. See, I've never had cow peas before. First time I've grown them. So that's the experiment to learn how to eat them then. And they grow so well that it's worth the time. Ah, you can kind of eat the shell. Yeah. Probably should be cooked. I'm gonna try it first. There's a lot of green ones on here yet. I think I'm gonna pick them and price them up and make a ferment. Not too bad. So this is what I'm talking about. You can see the cowpeas have grown up. There are actually looks like they're a viner. Big leaves. And there's lots of peas in there. I call them a cowpea, but I think it's a bean. That's the shell that I thought was really moldy, and I was wondering if the beans are moldy, but they're not. 
And here's the patch. Let's see if we can find a couple green ones here. Oh, that one's pretty hard now. The one I just picked is really green. Maybe I got the only one. But I think if you pick these now, while the shell is still green, even though they're harder, you can take the peas out and eat them. Their shells hadn't hardened yet. Whereas the ones in these dried out shells, you know, the shell uh, oh, crowning the pea itself, not just this outer casing here, is hard. Well then, what I'm doing, what, I, what I've learned to do the last couple years is to ferment them. Ferment beans. So I'm going to ferment these cow peas like I've been fermenting the beans in the winter. And I didn't have to do anything, no processing involved. Here's the peas right here. No processing involved. They've got their own little protective shells. The only concern is there's a protein called lectin in beans, probably in peas, in all seeds, and that is a protective measure from the seed. The seed doesn't want to get ate. It wants to grow. So if you eat those seeds, it'll gum you up. And you look at these people walking around all gummed up, if you know what I mean. That's more than likely what it's from. You know, the other main, you know, very terrible food source is sugar that's doing it to them. And, you know, there are a lot of secondary little chemicals that these plants don't want you to eat them that people are afflicted with. But lectin is one of the main ones. So when you ferment it, there's a recent study that proved that after three days of fermenting, 95% of the lectin is lessened. So that's what I'm going to do. Since these MAGA roots are dying back, we should pull them out of here. And there's another one in there, yeah, there's another one right here. Oh, that's a nice one. MAGA root. First MAGA roots I ever took out of my garden. I've been planting them for three years, but the mice really like them, let me tell you. <laughs> they go after those before everything else. Of course, now that I got... Uh, uh, black salsi growing. That's probably the number one plant now that they eat. Well, I just pulled this beet out. That's a yellow beet. We're going to have yellow beet to eat. Yellow beet to eat. It's kiwi time. They're soft. I've been noticing that the ones that are shiny are still hard and when they got kind of a dull look to them, they're soft. Oh wow, that's good. Definitely kiwi time. Wow. These are red beauties and they taste like spearmint. I got one, two, three, four, five plants. Oh, those are hard, yeah. Five plants that have a, have making kiwis. This one's nice and soft. Get a sunshine shot here. Spotlight. Is on the kiwi. Hmm. Sure glad I decided to plant these guys.
there's some just out of reach. I can see a rape up there. I'm gonna have to get the ladder out. Or else I can jump. <laughs> These are hardy kiwis. They are not ripe yet. It's a different style. Got some up there, got some up there. These were hand pollinated. I'm not sure what these are. The plant was given to me to, by a guy, a local farm, local market gardener. And he died and he never did tell me what they were. He just said, here, these are kiwis. Or up here. So these are lemony quince. They're hard as a rock. That's a really nice picture right there. And these are carnelian cherries I have grown in the backyard. This is a carnelian cherry tree that I have no pollinator for, but it's making cherries. I don't know if it's self-pollinating itself or, oops, or is it pollinating with something that's nearby I don't know about? Or is it pollinating with other dogwoods that don't produce cherries? But this is his third year it's made cherries. First year I think there was only like three or four or something. Last year there was maybe a dozen or so. This year there might be 20 or 30. Now I planted the seeds from last year or the pits. I don't know what you would call them. And none of them sprouted. But maybe it's a two year thing. So, uh... We're gonna go right ahead and pick these and we'll show you what we got. I also have picked a, about a half dozen or something that were on the ground. I just put another one on the ground. I'll show you those too. I'm not gonna put those in the bowl. Here are the ones that I picked. There's a couple still left in the tree that wouldn't come off with a, with a touch. These I just kind of touched maybe moved them a tiny bit and they just came off in my hand. I do want to show you something very interesting. Might give some people ideas. Good ideas of course. We have, uh, I'm right next to my shed. There's my shed roof. The tree somewhat overhangs the shed. You know, maybe 20% of it or something. As I look over here, look what I see in the rain trough. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something, huh? You, you can put some sort of a slanted board underneath your trees and have it reach out to a rain trough like this. Now this one's been, this is this isn't really right, but the sea is worth something. Or the pit. But you just wait for them to fall off. And you know they're at the ripest point when they're falling off on their own. <laughs> that gives me some ideas. I gotta think about how I can apply that. I'll also put in there. This I got another place for. <laughs> okay. This is our bowl of cherries in it. And these are the ones that were laying on the ground. So some of these I'll wash up and eat as they are, and then the ones that are really pretty crappy. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take them and smoosh them up a little bit. I've got a couple of ferments going. I'm going to take some juice out of that ferment and put those cherries and the pits of these cherries into that little ferment for two or three days. And then I'll plant them. Because that's what I want to do. Kind of mimic going through the intestines of an animal. I have no idea what this is. That is growing on a grapevine. This is a Fontenac Gris, or Gris, or however you want to pronounce it in French. 
I don't know what that is. Some sort of sort of a seed ball without grapes are on them. Wow. Huh. I'm gonna get a picture of the leaf with this thing here. There. Quick regroup. Review of what's still going on in the gardens here in middle of September 2020. Um, this has kind of turned into a nursery. This main crop garden number one. I'm nursing captivator gooseberries here and uh, ground cherries. There's a squash growing in here right now that we're still getting squash. And it still wants to make some more. There's another one coming right down here. That's really that's just a little bitty thing a little bit a couple days ago. It's really putting energy to it. And then I have elephant garlic in here that I allowed to go to seed. On this side I got Siberian sea peaches and I gotta show you these two trees in particular. These were girdled by mice last winter. So they were absolutely nothing when I cut them down. And now they're taller than I am. So these are six foot. Wow. Uh, other peaches in here as well. There's probably, I don't know, seven, eight of them in here. We got a couple peaches from pits from my backyard. They're growing in here. They're not doing that great because they're in the shade, but that's what they're going to have to figure out how to do. I'll be transplanting these in October after they start to lose their leaves on a very rainy day. Uh, they're heading north. I've got pawpaws growing in here. I'm probably going to transplant. There's three of them here. I'm going to transplant two for sure. I might leave one that's kind of on the shade side of the garden. I got to think about it. There's three grapevines here at the fence line. They're all going. They're all going to be transplanted. This pear tree that I espaliered. And that, by the way, this is a great way to make scion wood. You just, I just bent these things down when it was young. And I've got four of them here. And you can see they just sprout like crazy. And if you wait one year, those will be thick enough to sell as cyan wood. So if I take this back, well, let's get on the sun side of it so we don't have sun glare into my wore out lenses. And now you can see it. So it's like a 2D tree. There's just four main branches coming out of the stem. There's the stem. There's two branches. They're coming up. It splits into two more. And all of them I bent down, and then you can see all the sprouts coming out. And actually cut all of the, the wood off in middle of July, so two months ago. And now they're making all these new shoots. And if you wait a year, now if, let's say I would have cut it in the winter time, by the following winter you'd have cyan wood to sell. So this is a really good method if you want to just produce cyan wood. So this tree is going to be going. It's an old. It's it's not going to. I'm not going to get rid of it. I'm not going to kill it. I'm just going to dig it out and I'm going to transplant it. It's getting out of the main crop gardens. I'm going to refocus my attention to making main crops instead of all these experiments I got going on. Shift my focus a bit because the price of food's going up. I don't want to pay that money. So here we're nursing some chestnut leaf oaks. It's got that oak sharpness to it, but it's got that overall main frame chestnut leaf pattern. Those will be going up north, first rainy day in October. That's really raining. Well, I have to wait first rainy day after these leaves are beginning to turn. What they're doing is sending their energy back into the roots. That's when I'm going to take it. And uh, this one I might leave alone. I've got a couple of aronia. Plants growing in here. These are actually uh, grafts. I have some ground cherries. I have a pretty good lineup of ramps growing in here. There is a black currant that I'm transplanting out, but I can't bring those up north, so they'll be that'll be transplanted to the back. I'm gonna make some room. These are a hybrid willow, and they're supposed to grow like 20 feet in a year after they're established. And it'll be for coppicing whips, producing whips. 
and I had delivered 25, and I think there's there's about 20 that are still alive. That's good. I've been eating kiwi. Oh my God, has this been just a glorious plant to have in your in your backyard? Just come out here and eat kiwi. And I've got some potatoes left yet to dig in here. I do have. Uh, some currants in here. I don't know. I'm, I might leave this one here because it's uh, an understory to this apple tree that's on a dwarf rootstock. And we have a couple of celeriac growing in here. Getting a good bulbian action on that one. Where's the other one? Oh, yeah, I got good bulbian on that one, too. Back here, I got another kiwi. These are uh, medlars. I got one medlar off one of them last year. I, it was excellent after you let it blit. Oh my god, it was nice too. So I'm gonna be careful with these guys. I wanna I wanna grow these and I might even order some more. Okay, let's go on to main crop garden number. We're gonna go to four because four is on the other side of the access road. Access path. It's the closest one to one. We're not gonna walk in there, we're just gonna do an overview from the Outside in, we have uh, honey berries. Of course, they won't fruit till next year. We got apples on the edge. I got potatoes there in the background. There's a mixture of gooseberries, ground cherries, and honey berries in along the fence line on the west side. And we have actually crops growing in here right now. We have a Swiss chard. These are fall radishes. They're gonna do very marvelously. I picked the first one yesterday. We have fall beets, and we have white salsify. There's actually some elephant garlic growing in there too. Skirt. On to the next one, which is main crop garden number five. See, production is just, just now starting to peak. And we have our cow peas right here. Let me take this out of the way. Those I'm going to be harvesting pretty soon, and the harvesting the peas and the beans, what I do is I clip them off at the ground, leave the roots in the ground for the nitrogen fixation, and then I hang them in the shed for a while. Let them completely dry out before I store them. The leaves will suck all the moisture out of it. There's some beets there on the end, but they're getting pretty chewed up by the mice, so I don't know how many are left of them. This grass is white salsify. We have a terrific parsnip crop. Everything I pull out of is large. Beyond that is a black salsify patch, but that's been pretty much predated pretty good, so I don't know how much roots we're going to get. Um, some golden beets are left. I just dug potatoes out of there. There is an edible burdock. I just dug the beans out of here and hung them up in the shed. And this is a ground cherry plant. But all of this has yet to be really be harvested. I, I, I've been kind of hitting the edges. I've harvested some pet parsnips and some white salsify and a couple of white bark black salsify roots. I've been taking some beets out of there also too and they're really good. These are, those are golden beets. So all of this, there's a lot of food left yet and the main crop garden is number four and five. This is main crop garden number two. I already harvested ten ears of corn out of there and kind of a crappy amount of potatoes. The potatoes are bro were growing in the shade of the corn and I had a mulberry tree right here and I'm sure that's why it was a crappy harvest. But I've got a lots and lots and lots, lots and lots of climbing beans in along here. I, you know, she ain't gonna let me focus through that fence. Let me bring it up here. You can see that climbing beans hanging there. There's lots of them in this trellis right here beyond the amaranth. You see it's even still blossoming yet, so it's going to make more. And then that New Zealand squash that's growing in the other garden, that's actually, the roots are in this one. We have some shishandra berries are almost ripe, getting close. These are bitter. Don't want to really eat too many of them, but they're very healthy, so I eat them. Just come back here and pick at them as you're walking around. You eat a little berry here and a little berry there. This is a composting area. I spent a lot of time describing this one. There's a lot of food left here yet to be harvested. A, a ton, a lot. So, 
We're at peak. I could be harvesting it now, but I'm kind of dragging my feet. I want to try to make it into the cold season, and my basement is cold. I can start storing the stuff. This is main crop garden number five. We've got lots of yak on. We probably five times the yak on them on is what I grew last year. And then we have another trellis in the background there. It's just full of beans, climbing beans, just full. I guess we can see one or two there in the background right there. But as we go up it, it's just loaded. Now I like to have those dry out, in the, at least in the, if I don't dry them here, here's some more right here. If I don't dry them out here, outside, then I clip them off down by the roots and hang them upside down in the shed and let them dry out in there. Here's some hardy kiwi that aren't ripe yet. <laughs> Picture that baby. <laughs> There's a couple dozen on that barn there. We hand pollinated them. Back here, I guess we can call this bank crop garden number seven now if I call compost area number eight or number six. I've already harvested seven ears of blue hoppy corn out of here and a couple bo little bowls full of tomatoes. There's tomatoes that were volunteers. They're a wild tomato. I think it's a spin-off of the teeny toms I had last year. And um, there are one, two, three, four, there's five cobs left to get in here. And we're growing pumpkins. You can see we've got that, I forget what they call it. Uh, <laughs> well, it'll come to me after I shut the camera off. But I already harvested one pumpkin and there's more pumpkins growing out away from this patch. There aren't any pumpkins growing in the patch. They all migrated out of the patch and are growing in the trees. Then we have main crop garden number eight that's finished. I harvested uh, a half dozen watermelons out of here or something. And it's trying to grow some more vines. Is that a peach that fell off of the tree there? Yeah, I think there's a peach in there. I gotta get in there and see if that's ripe. I guess I didn't check this peach tree today if they were ripe. See, look at that crack there. Still hard as a rock though. Well, you know, the squirrels come along and they nip at it. And even though it's not ripe, they just clip it off of there. Eat more homegrown kiwi. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> wow. Wow. My belly's gonna pop. Oh, yeah. Oh. Don't know which one to grab first. For a long time, it was just uh, one or two ripe here and there. Now it's belly popping time. Look at them all in there. Yeah. Can eat them all. Mmm. Yeah. Can't see. I'm looking through the camel lens now. Mmm. 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 -hmm. Wow. Like a dang have a have a spearmint flavor to them. Oh look at them all there too. Ooh, that one's hard. So oh, that one's too. You see how that's got kind of a shiny, more opaque look? And when you look at this one that's right, it's duller. Now you don't have to feel them. I was feeling them to find out what they're looking like. kind of look at them first. Oh, there's one hiding up in there. Got it. Yeah, there's one up there. I gotta get a ladder. Mm, look at that big one. Oh, baby. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, that's really spearminty. This plant is really a good one. Very flavorful. More flavorful than the others. This is Arctic Beauty Kiwi.